What's the worst property investment you could make? I mean, so bad that you're actually potentially better off not even buying anything. You may have heard of off the plan property, but do you know exactly why it's the worst property you could actually buy? In this episode, we're talking about the big trap salespeople do not want you to know the financial issues that have landed so many new investors in hot water and the lack of control that could have you actually losing money even over a 10 year period. If you know anyone that's about to buy off the plan for their sake, send them this episode. Let's get into it. The traps that salespeople don't want you to know is actually how much commissions are built up into this, how much taxes and development margins are built up into each sale. Now, I'm not saying anyone can't earn money when making deals or doing business. That would be biased of me because I am a buyer's agent, I run a buyer's agency, and we assist clients. But there's differences. We charge a fee for service, and that fee for service is separate. It's a concierge activity. It's convenience, research, strategy, execution, time saving, all put together. It has separation from the deal. The deal has its own comparable analysis. It has its own metrics. It has its own data and its established properties, which mean the deal is based on its own merits with no external factors like taxes or like commissions built into there and heavily built into there. So this is important to understand because when you have that built in and there are sales occurring and the market trends are not matching those sales occurring and the fat that's in those deals, well, you get issues with certain data. In fact, I've got data here around a particular block in the Sydney suburb of this one here. I'm just looking over is North Ride. Now, check this out. Hundreds of apartments were sold off the plan from November 2016 to early 2020, right? And settlement was in quarter one of 2020, which is a pretty chaotic time. Now, in this period, this is quarter one, so not the whole way through of lockdowns, but by the way, 84% of all bank valuations were below sales prices. That's, that's nuts. And most of the 16% of the price cases, which were like on price, were actually sold early or early to mid 2019 and 2020 when Sydney's market actually almost bottomed out. So you're talking about a decline and many people getting out for those sales, thinking that, hey, I bought these properties at a good time and I'm in the bottom period and things are going to go well. Don't worry, Sydney's going to come around again. But many sales actually still you know, fell, fell off. So these valuation shortfalls are a huge problem. Now, there are even banks that put postcode restrictions with LVRs just in a really good suburb but in certain apartment buildings because they might have exposure to too many there, too many investors are buying them. And the, and the stats are quite different as well, by the way, like in comparison to off the plan owner occupier purchases versus investors. There are some blocks which can be two thirds to three quarters investor owned versus owner occupier properties being the dominator in houses, right? Now, I think the key thing to recognize here is that the margins, the taxes, the market timing, the length of market, activity needing to wait years for these apartments to be built and the commissions all were bad news stories for these people in that particular suburb of North Ride who got hammered with valuation shortfalls. They ended up having to chip in more money from their pockets. They ended up having to you know, let go of deals and lose deposits. This is unreal. The same is occurring in many parts of Canberra as we speak. There are developers in many parts of Canberra who had house, not units now because people might isolate that's units, house and land packages where people in the outskirts or near ACT in Canberra or in certain area, uh, areas of New South Wales touching that market too, are seeing house and land packages that they bought some time back start to be registered, start to come through, and the valuations are coming back short. So that's a big part. Pricing, timing, margins, taxes, commissions, all these things built up, and then just the valuers don't come to the party. And it's not like established property where you might have finance clauses, protection, being able to get out, use comparable sales, clearly challenge deals with high accuracy, multiple bank valuations to really feel good about it. You have some of the aspects there, but not all of them. And that's the first trap you really want to avoid, having lost money, lost time, 
and opportunity cost just because you didn't know this. Now, the second part of that first part that people don't want you to know is actually the delays. Um, one of the things is it can feel like a high pressure sales environment. It can feel like you're sitting down and going through some exciting projects, the actual models, the buildings, the designs, the videos, the uh, actual 3D rendering, all of this looks really exciting, but how much time is there between the actual things that you visually see and what you physically get? Now, I'm just gonna go through some data here in terms of the average number of months to build a dwelling, depending on certain uh, certain years as well. So if we go houses, the uh, and this is by the way of Cain Cambridge News that released this data. So if we go to houses in 2020 to 2021, this was 8.7 months on average, okay? Now, if we go to 22, 23, where we are now, that's 11.7 months. So that alone, just from the COVID delays, the supply impact, the price margins, the things that are happening from overseas and locally conditions coming together are delaying that. Now, if we go to townhouses, 12.7 months on average, going up to 14.9 months. Now, here's another one. Apartments actually are fluctuating. So we have data for apartments going back to 2015, 16, which was 21 months. This jumped back up in COVID time to about 30.6. It has recovered again to 28.8. But hey, that's a lot of time. You're, you're circa two and a bit years where what could happen to your job? What could happen to your finances and your savings, your cash? What could happen to the economy? What could happen to that market? What could happen to prices? Lots of unknowns. So this is some of the things that many people don't want you to know. And the common thing that people will say is, well, you're getting a really good price now. So the time of build price will be much better and you'll have equity left in, but you didn't have to pay interest rates or interest or bills. Well, you could have invested in established property and you might have gotten growth, if not more growth as well during that time. And you could have leveraged it, not waiting for two years, but you could have leveraged it six months in, 12 months in, 15 months in, 18 months in, access that equity and done it over again without actually compromising or having so many unknowns. So this is the first and important part. All this time relates to control, right? And if you're going to have a lack of control on your journey, then you're just increasing the variables that are working against you and not in your favor. We've all heard it's in favor of the house, right? The old casinos, gambling. Um, oh, think of that in the world of property, do you really want to do that with your own personal money? And I'm not talking maybe a cheeky hundred dollar slap with, with the boys or the, or the girls on a night out. <laughs> I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment money, interest payments tied to a mortgage, all these things in your decision. And you're about to gamble because there's this gambling of data that you don't have clarity on, which I'll touch, touch on with the next point. There's also this lack of clarity on actually how long it will take to finish the project. So this is huge. And whether the valuation will come out or not, like, do you really want to take these risks? So this is the first thing that looking here, like the traps that salespeople just don't want you to know. And there's so much inbuilt in that. And so this next part that they don't want you to know, which they themselves don't even know actually, is the demographics, right? So demographics aren't an absolute decider of price growth but they are a pretty big influencer because when those demographics are established, that's when they're not as big of a decider because they're established, they're factored into price. But when you're coming back to that controllable piece, if you're looking at demographics and you don't know what they are, a new house, a new suburb is being built, then it's actually not a controllable factor or a constant, it's a new piece. It's a variable that's changing. And so you therefore don't know how many owner occupiers are gonna be in this area, how many investors are going to be in this area. You don't know what the type of incomes are, the types of houses that will be built, the finishes across all of them. Will they all be cookie cutters and look like one? Or will there be multiple variations and have some character and differences to the suburb that you'll start to see some actual movement and you know, looking at it, feeling it. Like all these things will come in. Not that every part I mentioned is important, but they all play a factor because if it's constant, like the same demographics there and they just revolving and changing slowly over time, then that's not a big price variable. But then if it's a new thing, that new thing you couldn't have known. And this is what I mean. The salespeople selling you this wouldn't have known this either because they're just going to say, I don't care if you're an investor or an owner occupier, a mom and dad or a grandpa or a grandma, whoever signs this contract, I'm winning, you're winning, move on. And that's in their eyes, right? So if that's in their eyes, it doesn't matter what the demographic is when it's coming in there. They just need it gone. 
And so this is something to think about. And I'll give you demographic data now to just show you the variance examples from a Western Melbourne example. So if we're going to Western Melbourne, the old suburb, uh, if we're looking at the old and new because of this transformation that occurs, there was a demographic change in a suburb, and I could be pronouncing this wrong, Strathtulo. <laughs> so if you're, if you're a Victoria, Victorian, let me know, Strathtulo. Um, this is a demographic change here. What we saw in the 2016 census was Melton South. Now, Melton South was divided into multiple suburbs in 2017, including this one as an example. If we looked at 2016 census, Melton South had a 2.6 average household size. It had median weekly household income of 1,100, median age of 35, and there was also variances in the number of single-person families and four or more bedroom dwellings. So there's, there's demographics that, if you go deeper and deeper, were obviously attributed to Melton South in 2016. But then you go to 2021, from the sheer population growth, from the division of the suburb, from more houses coming in, you see large variances in demographic data. You see the median age had a variance of 17%, and that came down to 29. So obviously a lot of newer buyers would have been coming into there. You see, interesting fact here, median weekly household income jump up by 98%. So that's a big change. But then how do you know that going into a suburb, right? You just don't. So there's that gambling concept coming in. And then average household size started to increase as well, uh, and more families start to come in at 23%. So this is just one example. If you go to Caulfield now as another example, Caulfield in 2016 had a average household size of 2.5, and that kind of stayed the same in the 2021 census. Um, this is now more of an established suburb, right? You have median age of 41 in 2016, and median age was 42 in 2021. So you see, there isn't this huge variance. The income grew here, but all other things, uh, and income should grow, by the way, because you're looking at a five-year gap, four-year gap in census timing. So uh, five in the case because COVID was there. But all the other metrics, because this is a more established suburb, remained very similar. Caulfield did not have that constant change. Whereas Melton South to Strathtolo had this big change. And so you can see that you would not have known the demographics going into investing there, and you would not have been able to attribute how that change occurred because suburbs are getting cut, chopped, divided, and new ones were being created. So this comes back to that point of lack of control, right? And also there happened to be a performance period of low performance actually in Melbourne between 2016 and 21, uh, just so you know as well. So these are just some examples. We've got demographics, we've got looking at actual bank valuations and margins and things built in. We've got controllables and uncontrollables, right? From time of construction to actual data of an area. Now let's look at the clear thing that you're looking for, which is performance. Now, I've got to admit, I'm picking markets to show the performance. So that's the same with the me saying one opinion and say someone else picking their suburbs to show their opinion. That'll never end, which is why I wanted to give you those other examples first before coming to performance. But it's the fact that knowing these performance metrics and the fact that you could have picked different markets in the same city, same city, and just pick different markets that could have led to your actual end performance being quite different. It's just food for thought to be able to then help you take a step back and make the best decisions you can. So let's take Sydney, for example. We took the region of Rouse Hill versus the region of Borkham Hills, and we looked at performance and building approval data combined together. Now, when we look at the performance here, Borkham Hills was an actual very established area, whereas more Rouse Hill was quite new. Now, looking at their median prices of that region, I'm just not talking the suburb, talking the region of Rouse Hill and the surrounding suburbs, that was about 29.4% capital growth from 2018 to 2023. So pretty weak performance when you actually look at it in comparison to national, but also in comparison to Borkham Hills, which did 53.9% during that same time period. So we're talking about like, within 20 minute drives apart here, and we're seeing a shift of performance just because that controllable factor was there from everything to do with established supply, trends, actual prices of what's being sold. Um, those are the factors that were there for Borkham Hills that led to its outperformance. If we move to another market, we'll look at um, the, the region of Whittlesea Wellen versus Kingston. Uh, another major city here, and that had 13.6% for the newer area in capital growth during the same five years, and 23.2% in the older established area in the same five years. 
If we go to Brisbane, there's the region of Jimboomba versus the Hills District. Again, two different regions of Brisbane. And if we look at them, we would have seen price growth of 38.1% in the newer region and 51.4% in the older region during that same time frame. So there are some cities that just perform weak overall where there was established a new, but still the established took that little bit higher in performance. And even if you factored in things like maintenance and costs like that, you still would have come up a little bit higher. And so this is because there are so many controllables, non-controllables that you got to weigh up when you're making a decision. And as a researcher, I just like to have more controllable factors. It does not mean, again, in isolation, building approvals drives price growth or decline, but it is a factor that in certain markets, if you have more controllable factors in your field of play, you end up having a higher chance of your decision being a better one than worse. And that's the simple piece there. It's not the isolation of new build, old build. It's not the isolation of the supply part. That part can be measured in many other ways. It's more about having more controllables so you have less risks that move the trends and therefore the performance ends up being better. So in summary, if you're taking a step back, you want to make sure that you look at this performance in a way that really sets you up for investing success. And ask yourself these questions. Do you want traps in your buying process from valuation, time lost, opportunity cost, and lack of understanding of the area that impacts your buying decision? Well, if you don't, then stay away from that trap. Secondly, do you want to avoid lack of data decisions and having decisions that are more like gambling or just taking quick hits at the casino to hope your future's changed because you don't have any of the deeper data that you know, you can have for established areas and you want to make sure you avoid this issue, well, then you know what to avoid here when it comes to the type of investments to make. The third and final part, if you just like higher performance likely being in your court rather than having the risks against you because of all the unknowns, then you know where to go for purchases to make in more established areas. So it isn't the end of, you know, all new areas and you can't buy them. It's just more so having more controllable factors in your field avoiding traps of the off the plan buying that can actually impact you from all those lack of controllables and examples I've given you and making better decisions moving forward. So if you enjoyed this episode and you want more episodes like this, hit the like and subscribe button on YouTube. And if you're say tuning in on our Apple podcast or Spotify, would love for your support and leaving us a review so we can produce more episodes like this and uh, keep the content coming.